Good afternoon and welcome to the Healing Power of Nature presented by the Nature Conservancy in Connecticut. We're thrilled to dive into the program today. So nature heals, nature restores, and nature provides. Coming into spring, nature is an escape for many. Today, we'll take you to one of our favorite places to unwind, explore the ways nature contributes to our mental and physical health, and learn how our supporters interact with nature. We'll start with Sophie Duncan's story, a land steward with the Nature Conservancy in Connecticut. In her role, she works to ensure that some of the most amazing places in Connecticut remain great places to visit. Sophie Duncan is a land steward at nature preserves across the state. What's really been on my mind is the land that we inhabit and our relationship to it. We can see the history going back thousands of years in Connecticut in terms of who has been there and who continues to be here, but who has power. You know, what does it mean to have an honest relationship with the land? And what does it mean to have wonder and awe and these incredible experiences outside? And then the realities of how these places came to be and who has access to them and how to hold both of those truths that something can be truly special and wonderful and also have a really dark history of how it came to be. Hello, welcome to Burnham Brook. I'm Sophie and I'm a land steward with the Nature Conservancy in Connecticut. I'm so excited to share with you one of my favorite hikes today at the Burnham Brook Preserve. Burnham Brook has over a thousand acres of protected land and includes the headwaters of the Eight Mile River. In the Eight Mile River, it's an important habitat for Atlantic salmon and this preserve is home to over 180 bird species. In addition, there's all kinds of woodland habitat which includes trees like cedars and hemlocks and oaks and hickory and maple and all kinds of other species. Burnham Brook is located in eastern Connecticut in East Haddam and is an incredible area to come for a picnic with your family, to walk the two mile loop through various habitats and just enjoy wildlife, plants and nature. This is the preserve entrance. It's right next to in a meadow that is home to many bird species. Along the path, you might see trees like this one on the right with lots of holes in it. These are made by woodpeckers, one of the many species of birds that live at Burnham Brook. Although the trees aren't as green as they usually are, it's incredible to go hiking in the early spring because there's lots of sunlight that filters through the trees. This is one of my favorite parts of the path because the trail goes parallel to the Eight Mile River, so you get to walk alongside it. Listening to the Eight Mile River with the sound of birds in the background is one of my favorite things to do on a warm, sunny day like today. While I'm hiking, I like to look at the big stuff as much as the little stuff. This is one of my favorite trees on the trail. Look how cool the base of the trunk is. It's all wide and then carved out in the middle. Stuff like that is super neat and all along the trail. In this part of the hike, in the southeastern portion of the preserve, you might come across a boulder with a poem on it. This poem is by Dick Goodwin, one of the co-founders of the preserve, along with John Ide. It indicates um, an important moment for the Nature Conservancy because it was the first piece the Nature Conservancy protected in the Connecticut River watershed, one of our important areas for conservation. So this plaque and poem, if you see it, is for Dick Goodwin. And the trail continues and passes a vernal pool. This is a vernal pool and it's the home to wood frogs and spring peepers. And there were some ducks here earlier. It appears in the springtime as water collects. And earlier today, I saw some ducks and heard some frogs. Well, thank you so much for coming to Burnham Brook Preserve. We really hope you enjoyed your time visiting it virtually and we encourage you to come visit in person sometime. Whether it's a drizzly day like today or a beautiful sunny day, it's always a wonderful time to be outside. Just make sure to bring water, bring a mask, stay safe, and check the weather before you leave. Remember to follow the latest guidance for remaining safe outdoors when you visit and check out nature.org slash Burnham Brook for more information. Thank you, Sophie. So one of the main ways we think about how nature heals us is through our mental health, but how and where does that happen? Joining us now to discuss is Dr. Kiki Kennedy and Dr. Petros Lavinas. Dr. Kennedy is an assistant clinical professor in the Yale Department of Psychiatry, where she teaches psychotherapy and physician advocacy and has a private practice in New Haven, Connecticut. 
Dr. Levinas is a professor and chair of the Department of Psychiatry at Rutgers University, Rutgers, New Jersey Medical School, and is the author of an upcoming book, Nature Therapy, which will be out spring of 2022. Thank you both for joining us. First question, well, let's outline some of the ways nature contributes to our psychological well-being. Dr. Levinas, you mentioned this falls in two primary categories, correct? Yes, first of all, thank you so much for uh, having me in this program, and uh, I'm delighted to be talking about uh, nature therapy. Uh, two major categories. One is uh, the treatment of uh, psychiatric disorders. Depression is stress, is uh, aggression. These are things that have been uh, shown not as uh, well as we would like, but have been shown uh, to be uh, quite uh, helped by nature therapy. So we use nature therapy as one of the tools that we have in treating psychiatric disorders. And the second part of mental health has to do with the general uh, mental health of uh, pretty much everyone. Uh, it seems that uh, uh, nature therapy can be helpful in raising the, uh, the mental health, the well-being of uh, pretty much anyone, um, including people who do not have any psychiatric problems. So these are the two major categories that we're working on. Thank you. And for Dr. Kennedy, could you describe how nature works as a treatment in conjunction with medication and psychotherapy? Well, Andrew, that's a great question. And, you know, interacting with nature is a great way to reduce stress. Even before the pandemic, stress has been a major problem for millions of Americans. And over the past year, increasing numbers of us are reporting feeling even more stress. It's important to know that research has not shown that spending time in nature can prevent, treat, or cure any medical conditions. But we do know that interacting with nature can help calm us down and improve our sense of well-being. So it's important to address stress before it interferes with our lives, with our work, with our jobs, with our relationships. And we do have already many other wellness practices to reduce stress, like eating nutritious food, exercising regularly, getting enough sleep. And we can kind of think that engaging with nature is just another wellness practice that you can try to incorporate into your daily life. Some researchers have found that as little as five minutes outside in a natural setting, like strolling in a park or sitting in a garden, can improve your mood, self-esteem, and cognition. And in fact, there are many studies that provide and point to this positive correlation between engaging in nature and enhanced mood, self-esteem, and cognition. And like Dr. Lavunas mentioned, some studies have even shown that that calming effect of being in nature can actually lower blood pressure and, and decrease physical aggression. We don't quite understand the underlying mechanism for how it works. Perhaps it helps to simply restore our perspective. And anyone who's ever spent an evening gazing at the night sky uh, knows what it, that can do to make a big problem feel much smaller. Or perhaps it's just that as human beings, uh, we long for connections beyond ourselves and engaging in nature uh, can make us feel that somehow we belong to something that is greater than us. Awesome, thank you. And for, for Dr. Levinas, what ways do you incorporate nature into your psychotherapy practice? I'm gonna get to that in a second. I just want to add uh, something to what Kiki was saying. Uh, first of all, I couldn't agree more that, that that's where the, the state of, 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 the, uh, of the science is at, at this point. Uh, one of the more prominent theories about how nature works is through increasing the uh, tone of the parasympathetic system. Uh, when, we increasing, when we increase the para parasympathetic nervous system, that results in relaxation. It just cools the whole body down. And that's one of the more prominent theories about how nature therapy really works. So how do we use it in uh, everyday practice? Uh, the way I do it, is uh, I, I write it on a prescription pad, uh, the same way that I will uh, prescribe uh, an, an antidepressant medication or any other medication. I write it down and I say, spend uh, uh, two hours a, a week outdoors or five minutes uh, a day, depending on uh, what the situation is. Uh, give some uh, more specific uh, 
uh, instructions uh, which are specific for the patient. For example, taking a walk from home to the train station or sometimes from the train station to work or whatever it is that makes sense to the, to the patient instead of taking the bus, let's say. And uh, I hand that piece of paper to, uh, to my patient as a physical extension in some ways of, of the doctor to the uh, patient and giving uh, some uh, gravitas to uh, nature therapy so that the patient takes it seriously. Certainly, yeah. And we talked in our pre-conversation. We touched we touched on that and the importance of that. And kind of we 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 framed it in the, in terms of using nature as a clinical intervention and getting patients to kind of follow the instructions that you're giving on that prescription itself. Um, are there any other techniques that you can offer for guiding patients to apply it in the most beneficial way? Yes, uh, there's an emerging uh, uh, use of technology. In, uh, in, in our work. And of course, so we use apps uh, in terms of teaching people uh, sleep hygiene and helping them with all kinds of healthy habits. Uh, we can also use technology to uh, motivate people to go outside. Uh, map My Run is, a, is a, a, a very useful one. It gives you a beautiful map of exactly uh, where you went and, uh, and how long it took you and how much you walked or you biked. Uh, you can see the river, you can see the park. Uh, and uh, this has uh, a motivating effect uh, for, for the patient. That combined with social media, you can very easily upload your, uh, your path and, uh, you know, uh, you can boast about it to your friends, and <laughs> so be it. It, it. it sounds a little vain, but uh, it's for a good cause, and, and we like that. Anytime we can brag on doing something for a good cause, we love Absolutely. it, especially members of my generation. Well, Kiki, in our pre-conversation, we talked about um, travel, and when you travel, in what ways do you incorporate nature into your plans? I know for at least me, um, whenever I'm planning out my day, I make sure to include times within my schedule just to step outside. Um, take a quick walk and just kind of take a deep breath that way. And I find that like it creates intentional moments within the day. So I'm less stressed and I'm able to focus. I'm able to absorb information in a better way. It just restores me. So when you travel, do you have any specific routines or things that you do leading up to it to make sure that you have those moments in your day too? Well, um, I, you know, I do travel a lot for, um, for medical conferences and I'll let everybody know I'm a runner. I run daily and I love to run outside all year, no matter what the weather is. And so when I do travel to medical conferences, I often find myself in a hotel that's in a very urban and built environment. And I'm gonna, I, Dr. Levin has mentioned this app, which I don't have. I usually just look on my phone and use the map function there. And I look around to see, is there a nearby park? Is there a river? And then I intentionally run to that area um, and if those aren't available, I just kind of try to identify any tree-lined streets um, that I can run along. And I find that besides having kind of a more enjoyable run, um, I come away with the feeling that I have a deeper connection to the city because I've explored its, its green spaces. So it really makes me feel connected to a place. And certainly, you know, when I'm lucky enough to be able to travel just for pleasure, I always make sure that I choose a destination where I can spend at least a part of the day outside. It's certainly, certainly helpful. And, you know, we define nature in a number of ways. What if someone has limited access to parks or the large natural areas? Um, can they still feel that sort of restorative power of nature? Studies have shown you don't need vast expanses of wilderness um, to experience the psychological benefits of, of nature. Even if you just walk along an urban street that has trees growing along the sidewalk, can make a big difference than picking a route where it's com a completely built concrete environment. Certainly, you know, some people live in a neighborhood where there aren't even trees on, on their block. And so then you can just try to bring nature inside your home, in your home, bring plants in, put them around, make sure that your desk or chair is facing a window. Maybe you can have a peak of greenery or a river through the buildings. And honestly, if worse comes to worse, just have paintings or images of nature ar around your home. Um, and my last suggestion would be, if you don't have any nature around your home, consider um, engaging with your local community. And maybe there's a vacant lot nearby that you can restore uh, and make into a community garden. Try to bring nature into your community if, if, it doesn't, if it's not there already. 
one more trick to, of the trade here, and that's uh, college campuses. If you are in an urban setting, uh, and in, on the map it may show everything to be buildings, 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 Usually, the college campuses have more open space, they do have more trees, they do have uh, more grass, so uh, that's something to always remember. <laughs> always finding the hidden gems on the map there, that's so great, that's always good. Be able to find, kind of read through the lines a little bit and figure out where to go. Kiki, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you if you have something to add. No, I, I love learning from Dr. Lavunas. I've gotten so many great tips this day, today. I'm going to start writing my prescriptions for, for nature, too. Most definitely. We can, all, we can all have a prescription for nature, and we can all learn something. And kind of to that end, um, Dr. Lavunas, you have a book coming up soon, kind of around this. Do you want to describe that and when it comes out? Yes, it's essentially the, uh, uh, the birth child of uh, one of our residents here, uh, Dr. Uh, Jonathan Kaplan, Johnny Kaplan who is uh, a wonderful uh, bird watcher, and uh, he is the one who motivated me and a number of our colleagues here to, under, to, to put together our thoughts and our research on uh, nature therapy. Um, so rounding up the conversation here, is there anything else that either of you would like to mention that we haven't touched on today? I just want to add that architecture. Architecture is uh, also very interested in the beneficial effects of nature. And uh, not only they're bringing plants inside, they're breaking the inside-outside uh, barrier. Uh, they're very concerned about light and uh, views and, and so on. So it's not just uh, uh, psychiatry that's uh, fascinated and, and uh, uses uh, uh, nature therapy. It's also other disciplines. Certainly. And thank you both for joining us. And we'll look out for Petro's book, uh, Nature Therapy, this, this coming spring. So it's time for us to put what we've learned in practice. There's many ways one can connect with the outdoors or even forge that relationship. Tiana Williams describes her path. Tiana Williams spent her 30th birthday rock scrambling in Shenandoah National Park. After the fact, as we were like walking back, sore, dragging our bruised body, I realized that was just the first day I had that was like a truly sort of like full meditative experience. You know, when I'm doing these scrambles, when I'm summoning, when I'm doing all those things, all I can be is in the moment. I have to actually be fully present. I have to like be in constant connection with these boulders, these rocks, these trees, these birds. Like I have to get myself through this. I truly believe there's like mental and physical restorative capabilities. Even if you're just like forest bathing, it doesn't have to be anything intense. But there's just so many ways to get out into nature, to reconnect and just really force yourself to be in the moment. Thanks, Tiana. For forging that connection definitely requires some intent. Fortunately, we have people standing by ready to help. Joining us now is Monica Makara Flippo, Executive Director of Common Ground, located in New Haven. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Hi, Andrew. Well, first, could you describe Common Ground in the ways that it supports the local community? Sure. So Common Ground is a community nonprofit in New Haven, um, and we operate the Common Ground Charter High School, Common Ground's Environmental Education Center, and an urban farm. So um, members of the community experience Common Ground often through summer camps, field trips, um, sometimes birthday parties that we've hosted on campus, as well as um, students who come to our high school and folks who benefit from the workshops and the food shares and things that we do through our farm. Well, the pandemic upended so much of our lives. And could you describe how things changed at Common Ground and how nature supported the reopening of the school at summer camp? Sure. Um, so like with everyone else, you know, things ground to a halt really quickly at Common Ground. The high school closed. But even in those first weeks of the pandemic, our farm was operating. Our community program staff was on site um, as essential workers because we have crops and animals to take care of. And we immediately pivoted to food um, to food security work. So starting with food that was in our school kitchen and then moving towards food from our farm and then even partnering with local organizations um, and other farms in the area, we built a pretty robust food box program that was initially just supporting our students, but as it grew, was able to support um, families in New Haven that were connected to our school in other ways, as well as a lot of families in our neighborhood of West Rock um, a Senior Center that's up the street. And we partnered with our Alder 
So um, we really worked on food security for a while, while things were really shut down. Um, and, you know, in the late spring, we started thinking about what it would mean to operate our summer camps. Common Ground Summer Camps are quite an institution that, you know, people in this area really love and children really benefit from. We serve student children as young as age three, going up to like 15 and 16 year olds. Um, and it was a big decision, right? Should we open in person? And we all knew that outdoors was the, was the place to be, right? If they're gonna be safe anywhere, outdoors in nature is the place to be. And Common Ground sits on a 20 acre site at the base of West Rock State Park. So we thought we had something that would, um, where we could really address some of the mental health challenges that young people were facing by bringing them back on campus in person in a safe way. So we were one of the first summer camps to declare that we would be opening. Um, we were able to serve um, a smaller group of campers this summer safely. Um, and that, um, as well as doing a small in-person summer school for students who've been really disengaged. And then that gave us the, the confidence and the practices to open the school in the fall. And gosh, we were so grateful for, certainly for nature and the space that we had to use um, outdoor classroom spaces and prioritize outdoor, outdoor time as much as possible for, for our young people. Now, there's a number of threads within that that we'll touch on within our conversation, but I'm interested in the food justice portion of it and kind of tra in, um, in tra transitioning efforts to food security. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about that and how Common Ground integrates food justice into its programs? Sure. So, um, you know, so we have a farm on site, like I said, and people know about the farm. But contrary to what some folks might assume, we are not an agricultural school. Our, we're not here to teach our students to be farmers, um, but the farm and the land provide such an incredible resource to educate um, young people and to provide access. And that's the primary focus of our, our farm. And in doing so, we're really thoughtful about the history. So in New ha we're in New Haven, which is a you know very rich, diverse community. And we're really thoughtful and aware of the, like the, the historical trauma of black and brown people associated with land, land, land ownership, working on land. And that is something that we take very seriously and think a lot about in our programming. So what we really strive to do is make sure that we provide a space for young people to start with just like wonder and discovery on our farm, learning about learning about food, learning about you know land and, and how we can grow our food. Um, really celebrating some of the ethnic foods that our diverse community loves and making sure we grow the ingredients for some of those ethnic foods. Um, and then, um, over time, some of our students do choose to to take paid jobs on the farm, um, and that for them is an act of reclaiming the you know reclaiming the land in a way that's um, empowering for them. Um, so that's a little bit about the food justice work, and then I guess also one of the things that we you know do we work on that is like just consistently exposing and giving access to you know healthy locally grown produce and teaching our students recipes and ways of using that produce that again like celebrate their ethnic backgrounds and their cultures um, and sort of uh, making sure that they see um, you know farm grown foods as a very natural part of their diet and their culture not as something that's uh, other than or foreign to them. Awesome. Makes sense. Makes sense. So Common Ground works, cl works closely with schools in a few capacities. Can you kind of walk through those and tell us how? Sure. So um, Common Ground has been part of the New Haven community since um, the early 1990s and has partnered with, you know, very joyfully with New Haven Public Schools in a lot of ways. One is through field trips. So before the pandemic, we always had field trips on campus multiple a day. Um, and our field trips are educationally themed and um, you know, things like teaching maple sugaring, we had maple sugaring on site or teaching um, about bees and honey production, because that's also something we do. So educational field trips is a big part of what we've always done. Um, we also have over the last few years developed what we call our schoolyards program, which is a program whereby Common Ground works with schools in New Haven to plant school gardens um, and um, create some habitat spaces and, and maker spaces and really has worked um, with 21 public schools in New Haven to teach teachers how to use outdoor spaces in, in education. And um, interestingly, we found both on our campus and in um, the schools that we've partnered with, but those spaces, one, they're amazing for just educating, you know, education, 
but they're also really amazing for social emotional um, learning and development. We found that he, again here on campus and off in other sites, um, children who are escalated, who are having a hard time, really respond to spending time outdoors. Um, and that's another like practice that we've been able to bring out to um, our partner schools. Definitely interested in talking more around the how nature is used in social and emotional learning, particularly at schools. I know in our pre-conversation, um, you gave an example um, of how one school is using it. Um, but could you dive into how um, some schools that you're working with are using nature to aid in that SEL? Specifically, I think it is through using um, those outdoor spaces as spaces that children can go to with an adult to take a walk, to talk about their feelings, um, and really acknowledging that the, um, you know, outside fresh air and the presence of green plants and the, the, you know, insects and small animals, those are things that really like bring peace to, you know, a troubled heart in a moment when, when children are escalated. There's a big difference between, you know, walking a student up and down the hall of an enclosed school building than taking a child outside, letting them breathe some fresh air um, and really take it, you know, think about what they need to do and support them. So we've, we definitely have seen our schools do that. Um, here on campus, we have a couple of spaces that we consider sort of sacred spaces for that, our wetlands um, and our, our children's garden, our spaces that children come back to. And it's funny now that school, um, you know, we have a lot of students who are virtual, they continue to talk about how they want to come back to those spaces and how much they miss those spaces. Now, also in our pre-conversation, you talked about kind of the cycle and kind of the process of, of offering moments of success for students to kind of re-engage them back into their educational learning um, and kind of academic course load, I should say. Um, could you dive into that a little bit, how that works? Sure. So, um, like I mentioned earlier, we do um, have a program by which we can provide paid jobs on campus for students. Again, part of our social justice work, right? Making sure that students who are providing labor are getting paid for that labor. And we found that some students who don't naturally gravitate towards academic learning do really enjoy, you know, the opportunity to earn their own money, the skills that they learn by working on the site or on the farm. And what we found during the pandemic is for some kids, that was the hook back in. You know, when a student maybe disengaged and wasn't participating in their um, virtual learning classes, et cetera, that we were sometimes able to get them back by sort of saying, well, come back to your, you know, job on the farm or come back to your job on the site crew. And then maybe they would come back for a couple. And in fact, today is a Wednesday. We have several students downstairs who are in the process of this. They came back, they were here this morning, they did their, their farm job or their site crew job. And now they're sitting downstairs in the gym, supervised by a teacher who's supporting them, like catch up on work that they missed or attending their virtual classes. So we've really found that getting students in that situation, one, they come back and two, they feel successful there. And that allows that's, you know, that success transfers to other to other things that are harder. And it also just builds relationships, right? Our students who do that kind of work have relationships with teacher with other than just their teachers. And if you're a student who struggled in school um, or anybody who struggled in school knows that those teacher relationships are sometimes fraught. Even if the teacher is amazing, you have your own like anxiety and insecurities you're dealing with. So now our kids have these adults that they work with in a completely different setting who maybe don't know you as the kid who doesn't do his homework, but instead know you as the kid who's like works really hard and, and um, you know, is really successful at pulling weeds or, you know, helping the cucumbers grow. And so those relationships are different for our kids. And we find that using those relationships, leveraging those relationships to get them hooked back into learning is really helpful. Certainly, certainly. And it's kind of a cool concept and great thing that you guys are doing there at Common Ground. Another program that, you've, that we spoke about is the Green Jobs Corps that you have there. And you've touched on it in a few answers here, but could you talk about the development of that, how it came about, and why it's still important to the New Haven community? Sure. Um, so it's been around for a few years, at least at least 10 years, I'd say. It is a um, operated out of the New Haven Ecology Project, which is the nonprofit that, you know, is the umbrella nonprofit here. And it is really a, like a job core program specifically for ground and ground high school students. And it's been great because we can par we, we partner with other agencies. So for example, URI, the Urban Resources Initiative at, um, out of Yale um, and other nonprofits in New Haven, we work with them and what they do is they, um, we provide, you know, students apply for jobs. So the, the, the agency will say, 
you know, we have 10, we need 10 students to help plant trees this summer in New Haven. Um, and our students will have to apply. They have to go through an application and interview process. Um, and then while they are doing that work, again, they're earning money. They're learning all the skills that one learns when one's working on a crew of, you know, planting trees, et cetera. But we're also providing leadership development. So we have dedicated staff here. And then we also provide sometimes a stipend to the nonprofit so that they can better support our students because, you know, they may be planting trees, but they're also setting goals around their, um, their own leadership development and growth and reflecting on them through the process. So I think, you know, through that program, we've been able to provide great community connections for our kids and then, you know, for community partners to have um, yeah, access to like a wonderful labor force of our young people um, and also continue like leadership development and coaching through work, which is not necessarily what happens when you, you know, just kind of go out and get a job at the supermarket, which is what I did when I was a, when I was a teenager. Certainly, certainly. It sounds like a great program and all that Common Ground has going on and something that through our conversation, I've learned a ton more about the organization and it's the totality of all of its projects and who it's working with. Um, so is there anything else that we haven't captured within this conversation that you'd like to tell us about Common Ground or about how nature has supported the organization uh, throughout the pandemic and outdoor learning? Sure, I think um, so. Um, I just the it is easy to underestimate sort of like the power of of nature to nurture young people's minds and create that sense of wonder. Um, young people go on to do many things out of after common ground and, and many most of them don't go necessarily go on to careers in environmental education, but they have learned a sense of like valuing our, our the land and the world, really thinking about their impact on the land that we see really transfer to whatever they do. And we're just really proud of our of our kids and our staff here at Common Ground and grateful that the New Haven community continues to, to support us and, um, and think of new ways that we can partner. I know I said if there's anything else and I suggested that you would be done with the interview, but we're going to go for one more thing. Just because in my personal interactions with Common Ground students, I've always been impressed by their level of focus and the level of just creativity that they have. Um, because I know when I was their age, just thinking about um, some of the topics that they're exploring and some of the things that they're doing, it takes a whole other level of focus that I'm seeing in this generation that we've seen in pieces of, say, my own or generations before, but this particular one seems to be especially special. So I can't let you go without asking you, is there something in particular about this year's students um, that have kind of come up through the pandemic that's special or that you've noticed that you'd like to call out and highlight? I, mean, I obviously want to call out and celebrate all the students who had to graduate or work through their high school experience in this pandemic. But I will say that um, all children are capable of amazing things. And at Common Ground, our curriculum, our mission is about activating young people's leadership. And that means we ask young people for their real opinions and take actions and make decisions based on those opinions. Um, we have students who voting member who are voting members of our board. Um, so I think when you think about that sort of focus and energy that you see from Common Ground students, it comes from a really deliberate approach to build them up as leaders from the very beginning of them coming to Common Ground and genuinely treating them as um, valuable members of the community who have their own voice that we listen to. Um, and I think when we do that with young people, all young people can, you know, can rise to the occasion and, and be those kinds of leaders. Certainly. Well, thank you so much for joining us and for the discussion. I've enjoyed it, learned a ton, and we can learn more about um, Common Ground on your website. You shout out our website, any social media? Yeah, it's www.commongroundct.org. And you can also click on a link at the top and sign up for a newsletter and you can hear about all the great things happening at Common Ground. And our summer camp registration opens tomorrow, April 1st. So if you're interested in that, you should check out the website so you can be ready for that. Certainly will do. Thank you so much, Monica. So trees are a huge part of a conservationist toolkit for addressing water and air quality in our cities, but they only go so far. Partnerships and community buy-in and involvement are key to ensuring that we work in a way that's truly sustainable. TNC has the reach of a global organization as well as the presence to act locally to keep our promise to nature. 
Next, we'll learn about a project centered in Louisville, Kentucky that's been used as a model across the nation. Then, Diana and Nguyen here in Connecticut will then take us to Bridgeport to explore a few ways we're working locally to improve the health of our communities. We launched the Green Heart Project to obtain clear and direct evidence of the relationship between nature and health. We are looking at it very critically as a great opportunity to restore health. We are looking at the environment in a much more rigorous way than has ever been done, and we're using trees essentially as a pill. Yes! Like they said, let's loosen up the roots a little bit. Yep, I am one with the earth. This is actually a major milestone. This is the first day we actually get to start the greening intervention, the planting of the community to begin to test the health effects. This is a $15 million, six year longitudinal clinical trial. It's unprecedented. There, there is no other project like this in the world. No one has, has planted trees the size we're planting out here along the highway in the quantities and the densities that we're planting anywhere in Louisville's history. When you look at all the benefits of living near greenness, one of the most profound benefits is in cardiovascular disease. There are thousands of cities around the world that are struggling with air pollution issues. Perfect. And we know that cardiovascular disease is the number one killer of people globally. We're looking at air quality and the mechanism the canopy plays in filtering air pollution and therefore the health effects on the population in the community that lives here. If you don't see the relationship between plants and clean air, then you just haven't gotten it. When we first started the Green Heart Project, we thought it was important for improving the health of a community. Now, with this COVID pandemic, we've learned how spending time in nature could improve our resilience, our immunity, our mental health, and our ability to cope with this pandemic. We know that we can't have healthy communities at any level within any socioeconomic branch without having healthy communities at all, socioeconomic branches. We have such disparity in our community. We have one of the most segregated cities. Our country is segregated. Our world is segregated. Rich, poor, black, white. And then this pandemic comes, and now we see how connected we are. If we learn the lesson from this pandemic that it is not just our own health and our own little world that we can create an <laughs> island to exist on, but that we need to work towards making a healthy community where people don't die prematurely. These things are not difficult to achieve. They're within a grasp. We just need the social will to accomplish that. How would it feel to a community that feels left out and unseen all of a sudden to be prioritized? I cannot imagine the difference in life expectancy in that community. And I don't mean years, That's good. I mean quality. And if you improve the quality, then the quantity would go up too. I hope that there will be another Green Heart Project somewhere else in the world. I hope there'll be three or four more to give everybody, policymakers, the general public, the confidence that this is actually a, a very real, investable, workable phenomena. A couple days ago, we welcomed in a new spring season, and today I have the amazing opportunity to share some of our projects under the Urban Conservation Program. I'm here at the Hall Neighborhood House in the great city of Bridgeport, where the Nature Conservancy partnered to plant some trees and biospells. The Hall Neighborhood House is a center that provides essential educational and social programming to Bridgeport residents of all ages. Come on, I'll show you around. So this here is a bioswell, and a bioswell essentially collects stormwater and filters the stormwater before it enters our local waterways. It runs from the streets and can also allow rain to enter from the sidewalks into the bioswell, filtering pollution that is picked up along the way. A couple years back when Hall Neighborhood House and Nature Conservancy collaborated to 
introduce some bioswales to the neighborhood. We also planted about 19 trees with the help of over 50 community members and volunteers, including some native species like dogwood. The trees not only provide the neighborhood with a fresh new look, but also provides essential environmental benefits such as tree canopies that help clear the air from pollution from ongoing traffic. Over here at the back of the Hall neighborhood house, we've planted a couple of those trees and across the street, we've partnered with the Bridgeport Housing Authority to plant some trees on residential properties. And here we have our second file swell. Again, the same system and just doing all the work we can to help capture and filter in stormwater. Alright y'all, thanks for joining me as I walk through our work here with the Paul Neighborhood House. If you're ever in the area, check it out. Take care. Thank you, Diana, for walking us through a great project at the Hall Neighborhood House there in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Joining us now is Drew Goldsman, Urban Conservation Director for the Nature Conservancy in Connecticut. He leads our work in cities and works closely to use nature to address many impacts of climate change within those cities. Um, can you dive into how those in rain gardens work to reduce localized flooding and clean stormwater in our cities? Yeah, sure thing, Andrew. I appreciate the opportunity. This project that we ha have partnered with in um, in Bridgeport is with a community center called the Hall Neighborhood House, and really kind of that's fundamental and center central to the work that we've been doing in Bridgeport is seeking community partnerships uh, to support health and well-being of community residents. And so um, the relationship with Hall began as we were doing our community visioning process called Green Connections in the East Side neighborhood of Bridgeport, which we had identified through. Um, some uh, assessments around access to uh, be the benefits of nature and particularly trees. And the East Side really rose to, um, to, the, to the top as a neighborhood that had a really kind of inequitable distribution of tree canopy across Bridgeport. So we got to know uh, community stakeholders from across the neighborhood and um, Hall Neighborhood House really um, became one of our core partners. And so we, we led a series of tree plantings uh, to uh, across their campus, the, the community center is, is deeply committed to ensuring that their grounds are um, as supportive of the community as their programming is. Um, and so in total, over a couple of years, we ended up planting 19 trees um, uh, around the campus. And then we uh, developed the first two right-of-way bioswales in the city of Bridgeport along Pembroke Street. And uh, bioswales are um, a really kind of interesting, innovative means of managing stormwater in a really decentralized way to help relieve pressure on the city stormwater system. But as with all natural climate solutions and nature-based solutions, uh, they're multi-benefit. And so they provide an opportunity to manage stormwater coming off of the street and the sidewalk, um, particularly that first flush of really dirty water uh, that otherwise would either be going into our stormwater treatment system or in directly into the Long Island Sound. Uh, and so they're really a, a pretty straightforward system of reestablishing some of the uh, the natural water cycle. So it's depaving a section of the sidewalk, creating a layer cake of uh, really sandy soils on top so water can move into it really quickly, uh, a bunch of stone on the bottom so that you can store a lot of water and really just help that water kind of return to its natural path, um, which unfortunately streets and a lot of impervious area um, have really kind of interrupted. And so it's really trying to restore that natural cycle. Um, all the while providing opportunity for natural habitat and improved greenery in a neighborhood that unfortunately has a long history of not uh, kind of receiving its fair share of, of, of nature and nature's benefits. Certainly, certainly. You know, when we think about emissions, you touched on cars there and transit off the road and emission in um, oil and all the little things that gather on the road and get washed off when it rains. Um, and the fact that bioswales kind of help filter some of those things. But, you know, when we think of emissions, we mostly consider those from vehicles. And there are some policy measures underway to address those. But as we understand, that's not enough on its own. Could you describe some of the ways we're using natural climate solutions to address air quality within our communities in Connecticut? Yeah, sure. So the uh, TCI or the Transportation Climate Initiative is a great undertaking across our region to really try to, uh, simply put, really electrify our fleet in many ways. And that's going to be a critical part of the, the supply of our pollutants, particularly uh, particulate matter 2.5. So that's the size of the um, particulate matter that really can more kind of deeply get into lungs and cause asthma and other respiratory illnesses. Um, and so that's a critical to address the supply side of it. 
But what we really see as a big benefit is kind of, we need to be coming at this from multiple angles. And TNC or the Nature Conservancy is really committed to that, that comprehensive approach. So while we're going for the policy side to reduce the supply of, of pollutants and air pollution, uh, we also know that we need to be investing in, um, in trees in particular, which is one of the greatest tools to pull out that PM 2.5 and other air pollutants, um, while all the while cooling our communities because the heat island effect uh, is another um, one of the other greatest kind of impacts uh, in, in cities as we have elevated heat and so trees can really help to cool. And that's gonna be something that while um, kind of pollution and ozone in particular elevates heat island, uh, regardless if we take all the, road, the, the cars off the road, we're gonna still have significant heat island effect because of the, um, the concrete and, and pavement. And so planting more trees is gonna be another really critical um, part of that approach. So, you know, we see it as, as really that comprehensive coming from all angles, thinking about the suite of co-benefits as we, as we like to kind of discuss, um, you know, thinking about air quality, thinking about heat um, and all of those supporting communities health in particular uh, communities that have been disproportionately burdened by uh, these environmental hazards. Thank you so much for joining us, Drew, and walking through how this, how we've operated in the city of Bridgeport and how we're open to operating in cities across Connecticut. Joining us now is Holly Drinketh, who leads our outreach and watershed projects with the Nature Conservancy here in Connecticut. Um, and she uses a lot of natural solutions to address climate change and some of the impacts of it. So Holly, thanks for joining us. And the first question for you was just kind of around the ways that communities in Connecticut are managing wastewater and stormwater. Can you outline those? Sure, thanks. Thanks so much, Andrew. Yeah, Connecticut, like many of the places, uh, states in the Northeast have been managing wastewater and stormwater for centuries um, to really protect people's health and safety. And we've made really great progress cleaning up Long Island Sound in particular uh, through upgrades of technology at sewage treatment plants. Um, there we're reducing nitrogen pollution that triggers algal blooms and that really uh, harms the environment through um, low oxygen dead zones that kind of kill marine life and habitats. But in addition to that, we've been really um, able to manage uh, water in cities from, from wastewater and stormwater where the systems are combined. And we heard a little bit about that from Diana. Uh, the, Combined systems collect wastewater from houses and industry through into sewer pipes at the same time that they're picking up stormwater from rain and snow melt. Uh, and they bring those to treatment plants to be treated before that's discharged into the waterways. But in some cases, when the snow or rain melt is very heavy, it overtops the system uh, and causes untreated sewage and uh, the sort of toxic soup of chemicals and, and contaminants to get into the waterways. And that makes yeah. it unsafe for shellfish and beaches. That toxic kind of mess going into the sewers, certainly something great for us to think about around lunchtime, but it is something for us to consider <laughs> in making the upgrade to it. And so you touched on it toward the end there around the impact at beaches. So when beaches close after it rains, we know that it's due to excess bacteria, but where's that coming from? And what's the link to our beaches closing to the much needed stormwater and wastewater upgrades that we're discussing? Yeah, so some of it is coming from those overflows, like I talked about. Some of it comes from things that we do on land. So, you know, walking our pets and leaving pet waste, that sort of thing. Um, and some of it comes from uh, our uh, leaky and old pipes, even from our septic systems. About 40% of the households in Connecticut rely on septic systems uh, for wastewater. But those technologies are old too. And in, in some places they don't do enough to really manage, um, you know, treat uh, some of the things that are coming out of our, our homes. And one of the things that we can do um, in addition to upgrading and modernizing those systems is to use things like natural buffers along waterways. So uh, meadows, wetlands, woodlands, they all help keep pollution out of our streams and harbors. Yeah, that's kind of where I wanted to go next with this is kind of the discussion around floodplains and the role that they play in our water quality. Can you touch on that and some of the restoration efforts that are underway here in Connecticut? Yeah, sure. You know, healthy river floodplains are magic and Connecticut is full of them and we're really lucky to have all of those. Not only do they absorb those floodwaters and reduce risks to infrastructure like our streets and houses, 
but when they're full, they act like natural filters and they can remove sediment and some of the nutrient pollution that degrades water quality and increases those treatment costs. Um, along with that, they play an important role in spawning grounds for fish and critical areas for rest and, and areas to stop from migrating waterfowl and other birds. And they are great places to enjoy outdoor activities and recreational um, opportunities in nature that we heard about from, from uh, the doctors earlier, that things like fishing and camping and hiking, boat watching, uh, uh, bird watching and boating, um, that all really support physical and mental wellness. And one of the ways that we're working on that here in Connecticut is bringing back uh, the old trees that used to be in Connecticut's riverways, the elms that have uh, suffered, and they're they're really making the systems healthier and making it better able to suck up all that flood water. Definitely the elm restoration effort is a big thing for TNC across New England, particularly in the Connecticut River watershed. But you know, we talked about natural areas there and how we can kind of contribute to um, addressing biodiversity or creating habitat um, for wildlife in addition to cleaning our water. But how does how can nature contribute to cleaner drinking water um, for residents? Yeah, that again, another sort of magic thing. Uh, forests are an incredible way for us to clean and protect and make sure we have adequate drinking water for everyone in Connecticut. Uh, it's, it's a great way to capture rains and, and um, snow melt, as I talked about before. And they also act as these natural filters. They, they treat the water before it reaches um, areas of like reservoirs river, and rivers that people depend on for drinking water. Many people know about the really terrific approach that, that New York City used in protecting forests uh, in the Adirondacks for drinking water supply for all the people in uh, the metropolitan area of New York City. But that's happening here in Connecticut too, and the Nature Conservancy has been contributing to protection in multiple drinking water uh, watershed forests, including Centennial Forest, uh, which protects the Saugatuck River and the Aspatuck River in Western Connecticut. And that um, helps to keep the water clean for many, many residents of Western Connecticut, including in Bridgeport and uh, other parts of Fairfield County. Certainly, certainly. You know, forging that connection, as we heard from doctors earlier, you don't have to go too far away to um, enjoy nature. It's available just about in, in your neighborhoods or even you can do like I have behind me here, wrong side, little zoom thing, <laughs> but with the plants um, in, your, in your own home, just to create some greenery and think, just to create some greenery around you and just kind of get that nature kind of within your life and within your daily life there. So I'm curious, with the protect, we talked about the protection of Centennial Watershed uh, State Park, that, State Forest there and its impacts on drinking water, but what efforts are underway to kind of help bridge the gap between, help create access to some of those areas? Yeah, so there are multiple ways to do that. We, um, the Centennial Watershed Forest in particular is about 15,000 acres and it's managed by uh, the Nature Conservancy, Connecticut Department of Environment and uh, Environmental, uh, en Energy and Environmental Protection, sorry, uh, and Aquarian Water Company. And they all work together to manage the forest itself but there are multiple ways to access it through uh, some of the trails in the watershed area. So the Saugatuck Valley Trail is, or Saugatuck River Trail is one opportunity and the Aspatuck Valley Trail is another opportunity. Also alongside that, which TNC's in biggest, uh, largest preserve in Connecticut is Devil's Den. And that's a place where you can go and access those trails as well and visit uh, those those natural areas. Certainly, and people can go online at nature.org slash Connecticut and explore our virtual, our interactive preserve guide to find their new favorite place to go enjoy those benefits. Thank you, Holly, so much for joining us. We'll leave you with a story and a prompt from Sunny Valley Preserve Director, Wayne Woodard. You know what I'd like to do is I'd like to share a sunrise with you. I'm sitting in the middle of a hay field on top of a hill in Bridgewater, Connecticut. And if I look over to the west of me, there's the Housatonic River. And, you know, because the water is just a little cooler than the air, 
there's like this river of fog that's just traveling right up the river. This is what I, I would recommend to anyone. You know, go find a good spot. And then one morning, just get up early, 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 early when it's dark. You know, get there before dawn and just wait and look and listen. It can give you peace, it gives you strength, and it gives us a new day. Thank you all for joining us. And again, I'm Andrew Benson with The Nation Conservancy, and we hope that you took something from this program and apply it in your own life, whether it's creating intentional moments throughout your day to reflect on nature and enjoy its benefits to relax and restore, or it's finding a new favorite place, maybe Burnham Brook Preserve. Again, I'm Andrew Benson with The Nation Conservancy. Follow us online on social media, at Facebook and now on Instagram, and also at nature.org slash Connecticut. Mm -hmm.